everyone, and welcome back to Oshanka Show, the place where you can all learn something new about life in the Soviet Union. I'm your host, Sergei Sputnikov, and we're gonna talk again about Soviet bicycles. So this is part two. If by any chance you missed my first video, I'll provide the link below in the comment section. But before we start, I would like to answer one of the questions. It was posted by Stellanio Cervantes, 5606. Uh, thanks for this video, it was enlightening. What about the parts? Was there any shortage? Unfortunately, yes, just like with the car parts, the bicycle parts were in short supply, especially like tires and bike tubes. Those were really hard uh, to get by, so people were repairing hardcore uh, the inner tubes. I remember a friend of mine, that was a constant occurrence. I remember watching him removing, you know, tire and a tube off the wheel, then locating the hole, you know, you put soapy water and then you squeeze and you see where the bubbles coming out. And then you kind of clean the surface, apply the glue, apply the patch, and he was really efficient with it. I can remember seeing that the bike tube, it had like maybe five or six patches. So parts were in short supply, unfortunately. So people tried to ride their bikes pretty carefully because once uh, you puncture your tire, you could be in trouble. But fortunately, bicycles are not really complicated devices, right? Especially a single speed bike with the coaster brakes, so really not many things could get broken besides punctured tires, so that definitely helped. And speaking of bike repairs, every bike, special adult sides, came with this leather pouch, or we call it bardachok, and it would be attached uh, to your frame or behind to your uh, bike seat, and that pouch would contain uh, tools to do quick repairs or adjustments. For example, if your front wheel became uh, loose, you can tie it up or your steering wheel or, or your pedals. So there was always a good idea to have this basic repair uh, tools with you while you're on the road. And this is the most important tool out of Bardachok. It was called Velocipedne Kluč. So that's a bike tool. And that had pretty much all the sizes that you needed uh, for your bike to do quick tightening, uh, quick uh, repair. And personally, I was pretty lucky with the bike breakdowns. I never had anything major happen to me. After I purchased my own bike, was tourist road bike. I rode a lot. I think first season I purchased my bike, I rode like almost a thousand kilometers, maybe even more. And twice I rode 100 kilometers in one day. So that's when I was going in the summer to the village. I wanted to have my own bike there. So I never had a chance to actually try to do repairs while on the road. And now let's talk about different models of the Soviet bikes and the prices. Uh, we'll try to compare was it really expensive or not to own a bicycle in the Soviet Union? And I know it's always a big challenge to do price comparison between the you know, Soviet Union of 1970s and 80s versus modern days uh, United States. And a lot of my viewers get upset when I try to do it. But still, we need to have some reference points. So in our late 70s, early 80s, average salary in the Soviet Union was about 150 rubles per month. So even if you're like an engineer, you're still going to have that salary. So there's the first uh, reference point, 150 uh, rubles per month average salary. Sometimes I like to add for comparison prices for bread or, for example, uh, the cost of public transportation. But since those prices were heavily subsidized, it's not really fair to utilize uh, those prices. So how about if we use a bottle of uh, vodka, vodka, half a liter bottle of vodka around five rubles in the early 80s. And just another reference point, kind of low end, my grandmother, Maria, was getting a pension of 12 rubles per month. So this is kind of like the lowest pay in the Soviet Union, 12 rubles per month for the former collective farm worker. And we will start with the cheapest option, a children's tricycle bike. And by the way, I think this photo is so adorable. I probably was taken around 1960s. And you see two kids using their tricycle so they can get some cold soda pop paying three kopecks if it has a um, syrup or just one kopeck if it just has a uh, bubbly water. So the tricycles manufactured in 1950s and 60s, there was this basic design, there's nothing unusual about it. The price was around 10 rubles, so two bottles of vodka. And for my grandma, it won't be enough money to buy just a tricycle with her monthly pension. Name was usually Malish, a little boy. And that's a lot of this bike you could see in the old black and white photos. And you need to keep in mind that quite often these bicycles were manufactured not by the bike companies, 
But for the regular factory that manufactured trucks or even maybe tanks, but they were required by the government, remember we had socialism and central planning, that you need to have 10% of your production dedicated to the normal consumer goods. So, for example, there'll be factories somewhere in Ural Mountains making as a side product those little tricycles. For example, this cute tricycle called Gnom can be translated as Dwarf. It was manufactured in southern Ukraine at UMZ, Yuzhny Mashnostritinny Zavod. So it's a southern industrial factory. And the main product of UMZ were missiles, military missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, space rockets, space engines, and stuff like that. But as a side product, they manufactured these cute little tricycles. This is the original model called Gnome 1. It was manufactured between 1952 and 1960. In the 70s, when the plastics began replacing steel parts, UMZ began manufacturing this updated looking tricycle called Gnome 2, later was Gnome 3, then Gnome 4. So they manufactured them all the way into the 90s. And at some point, UMZ was making 150,000 bicycles a year. So they were cranking missiles and cranking bicycles <laughs> in the same factory. When I was researching for this video, I discovered that a lot of people complained that these uh, little tricycles had a weak spot by the front of the seat where the weld failed quite often. So the popular way was to re-weld it at the local shop. And now these bikes became like a collector's items. Many people looking for them, they repair them, they make them look better, just, just like they do it in the West. And the price for this tricycle was seven rubles and 50 kopecks, so one and a half bottles of vodka. When I was a little kid, I didn't have a tricycle bike, probably because at that time we lived at the dormitories and it was a fourth floor and we shared a small room with another family for five years. So there was no extra room to store even a little tricycle. So no tricycle for Comrade Sergei. And when your kid was too big for the tricycle, uh, the next bike Soviet parents would consider buying was this Zaika. So there was a bigger bike. And that was the most produced bike in the Soviet Union. Uh, the factory was located in Lviv. It's a western Ukraine. The factory was called LMZ, Lvovsky Motor Zavod. And they were manufacturing scooters like mopeds and the bicycles. And they made a million of those every year. This little bike came with the training wheels, which could be removed if needed. Adjustable seat, only front brakes and fenders. They also manufactured so-called Zyka Lux model, so that had additional features. It had a front and rear lights, which were battery operated. It had also little backrest attached to the bike seat. The cost of Zyka bicycle was 30 rubles, so once again, average salary 150 rubles per month. So 30 rubles, that's a lot of money that way, right? Or it's a six bottles of vodka times $15, so it's about $90 per bike. Or for my grandma, there was over two monthly pensions to purchase a Zyka bike for their grandson. There were other children bikes in the same kind of class, like Zyka, like this one was called, I believe, Butterfly Babochka, but it looks like it was manufactured probably in 60s, early 70s, still had this old fashioned uh, leather bike seat, and the price was around the same. 25 rubles. And once again, my parents didn't bother to buy me a Zyka bike. At that time, we managed to get out of the dorms and moved in in a tiny one-room apartment. So there was no room once again to have a bicycle stored. So no bicycle for Comrade Sergei. After your kid was too big for the Zyka bike, the next step will be to get velocipede called Arlonak or Skolnik. So those were bigger frame bikes, not as big as the full-size adult bikes. But that will be the next step. And those weren't really popular because the price was 45 rubles per bike. You kind of like approaching adult size bike. So many parents be like, why wasting money on this smaller bike where we can get you just a adult size bike and you can ride that one. And that's what many kids had to do. They were still too short to ride properly the full size adult bike. So they would ride it called Padramai under the frame. So as you see at these two photos, it's a pretty small kid 
And it's kind of funky way you ride the bike because you have to lean away from the bike to get under the frame and you need to lean the bike the opposite way to stay in balance. So you could see that quite often kids riding under the frame, padramai. Or you could be lucky if your grandma or your mom has female bike, that's how we call them, ženski velocipedi, and then you don't have to ride the funky way under the frame. Another option was to get a folding bike which would be easy for a kid to ride. The most popular model was called Kama. That's a steel bike, of course. It was extremely heavy, but it was very popular among kids and especially among the girls. So Kama folding bike was pretty much like a Mercedes of the Soviet bikes. Despite the fact it was heavy, it was a really comfortable ride, had a very comfortable seat, tall, bars so that was comfortable to ride and it came with a kickstand which is soviet bikes usually didn't have so you don't have to find a wall to lean your bikes against or lay it on the grass you can always make your bike stand nicely and just like mercedes it was extremely expensive uh, kama was sold for 100 rubles so you are in an adult size upper bracket price points so spending that type of money on your kid that meant your family is doing well and 100 rubles, if you make average salary 150 rubles a month, that's a lot of money, or it's a 20 bottles of vodka. Another popular folding bike I must mention was Salute. The fireworks it was manufactured at Pianza Bike Factory, and it had the same issue. It was a very heavy bike, about 35 pounds. So for the smaller size bike, it's, it's a lot of weight, especially if you're a kid. It changed its look over the years and like by the late 80s, early 90s actually looked pretty sharp and was popular among the kids and especially the girls because if you wear a skirt, this bike was easy to get on and get off. As I mentioned in my previous video, the most popular bike in the Soviet Union was probably Ukraina, the Ukraine. It was manufactured in Kharkiv Bike Factory. At its peak, they manufacture around 800,000 bikes per year and total amount of bikes they manufactured from 1926 till early 2000 was 26 million. Most Ukraina bikes came in black color. They featured single speed, coaster brakes, and I thank you for letting me know the name. I didn't know how it's called in English. Uh, so they had a luggage rack, had fenders, no kickstand. It's a really, really basic heavy bike. And it was pretty reliable. And that was pretty much what I saw out in the country that most people were riding Ukraina bikes. Another popular adult size bike was Minsk. And you may guess it was manufactured at Minsk Bike Factory. Minsk is the capital of Belarus. And when I say popular, it was just readily available pretty much anywhere. So people were buying them. Price was around 75 rubles to 100 rubles. And same thing, just like Ukraine bike. You need to be like real bike aficionado to determine the difference. Okay, this is Minsk and this is Ukraina because they looked really similar, same size wheels, same kind of style frame. The only difference, Minsk came in different colors like metallic green or blue, while Ukraina was mostly black. There was a large bike factory in Penza, Soviet Russia, and that factory started as the munition factory. So they were making munition for the Red Army and bikes were made as a side business. Then they were switched completely to the bike production. They were manufacturing bikes from 1928 till 2016. They had quite a few different uh, models, Sura, Diana, Virage, Prima, Temp. Uh, one of them looked like Ukraine and means called Ural. So that was uh, their version of this standard. And I think it was copied from some German bike, maybe using some uh, German equipment that was brought after the end of World War II. So that's another uh, popular bike was Ural. Pianza and Kharkiv bike factories also manufactured sports bike and road bikes. The one uh, from Kharkiv was called Tourist. So that was kind of road bike for the bike tourists. And the one from Pianza was called Temp. And the Tourist bike, that's the one that I managed finally to purchase myself. I think it was 92 or 93. After my Minsk was stolen when I was still a kid. That bike had a lighter frame, a little bit narrower tires than Ukraina, had three speeds and mechanical brakes. So this is the case when if you try to pedal backwards, like trying to use the coastal brakes, you can't stop your bike. 
And I'm telling you this because this is how my bike got damaged. When I rode this bike 100 kilometers uh, to my village, one of the local guys asked me to take it for a ride. And of course, he was amazed because, you know, this bike was way faster than any Ukraine or Minsk have a road. So he took off like crazy. And on the way back, he decided to scare the girls. So there's a group of girls staying on the road. He decided to scare them. And to scare them, he wanted to slam the brakes at the last second. So, of course, when we approached them, he started pedaling backwards because he grew up riding the bikes with the coastal brakes. And he couldn't stop the bike, of course, because, you know, that's just your reaction. So he slammed the girls on the full speed and broke my front fork that was holding, actually, the steering thing. So, yeah, it was a disaster. Also, my bike had a plastic seat, hard plastic seat, and I can't believe that I actually get used to it so much that I could ride 100 kilometers, it was like 60 some miles, and I had no issues. And I actually did a couple of upgrades to my bike. The size of the frame was standard, I think it was like large. So with my height, and I'm like 6'2", six, 6'3", six, the extension for the seat was too short, so my dad made longer tube at the factory that he worked. So that was one of my custom thing down to it. And then when I went to America in 1995, I brought actually normal soft gel seat from United States. So that was a great upgrade. And of course, I had a couple of pretty bad bike crashes of all those years. And I remember pretty much all of them. One time I was riding my friend's Skolnik bike in the village. So it's a smaller size bike. I, my, my grandma sent me to pick up her pension. So on the way back, I was speeding on the sandy dirt road and I made uh, too tight of the turn. So the front wheel turned perpendicular to the bike. And of course, I flew right over and crashed pretty bad. And I just realized most of my crash stories are from the village because that's where I rode the bike a lot. Usually it was my friend's bikes. Another time I was given a ride uh, to a friend of mine, to his little brother. So he was sitting on the frame in front of me and we were going this narrow path that was kind of dodging electric poles you know just going around them and i was going too fast i didn't do a good turn and i caught the electric pole with my handlebar so it, of course it stopped bicycle right on spot so we flew <laughs> off the bike but because you know it's a village it's grass and dirt no blacktop no concrete we didn't get hurt another one was similar situation i was giving my little brother a ride and we were going really fast because he wanted you know go as fast as you can brother so I was pedaling, we are going fast, and somehow his leg got caught in the front wheel. That's a danger when you ride the bike this way, when you have someone sitting on the frame. They need to keep their legs away from the front wheel. And he wasn't paying attention, so his foot got caught in the front wheel. Of course, bike stopped right there. And I flew off the bike, but kid was pinned to the front wheel. So he got a, a lot of skin uh, stripped off his ankle, uh, so then I had to carry him around for almost a week, so that was pretty annoying. And another bike crash, once again, having a guy sit in the front on the frame, and I guess bike was old, or maybe guy was too heavy, but it was um, at night, we were coming back from the movies, up once again in the village, and we didn't have street lights, but we rode those roads so often that I knew, you know, which way to go, so we're riding, and suddenly I feel like we're going down, and I couldn't understand, like, I don't remember any kind of, you know, depth in this type of part of the road, and then I feel like my knees are hitting the ground, uh, so what happened, bike uh, fell apart, so the frame got disconnected, and it's literally folded on us, so that was pretty bad. But my worst bike crash happened in Kiev, when I still owned that Minsk bike that got stolen later, I was going way too fast, and then I decided to turn left on the other road, which had loose gravel. And I didn't realize that you don't want to uh, do a sharp turn going really fast on the gravel because I lost control of the bike. You know, I laid on my side and I was in shorts. So I really messed up my leg and the bike got jammed so I couldn't ride it anymore. So I had to walk for about probably a good two miles home, crying, bleeding off my leg and my arm. And it was some kind of birthday party at home because I remember I dragged my bike, sobbing, crying, all bloody. And there's my bunch of relatives and my parents sitting at the table drinking, eating. And there's their kid comes in all bloody. That was a mess. When I was researching for this video, I discovered that actually 
Quite a few of older Soviet era bikes became like a collector's items. People uh, searching for those little tiny gnome uh, children's bikes, those dwarfs, and even my tourist bike now became a collectible item. Unfortunately, when I moved to America, my brother was selling off a lot of things of mine because he didn't need it, he didn't care about bikes or my stereo. So he sold a lot of my stuff. So my uh, old tourist bike, unfortunately, is gone. And of course, right now, living in America, I can afford nicer things. So I have a pretty good mountain bike that I bought used on eBay. And I also have a road bike. It's not fancy carbon frame, nothing like that. It's aluminum. Uh, I think it's called uh, Cityscapes by Giant. I paid $500 for it new and I ride it a lot. My longest bike ride in America and in my life period uh, was so-called Odram ride it's one day across michigan ride oh my goodness that was the dumbest thing i've done but i did it it's about i believe it was like 141 or 151 mile it's from one coast of michigan to another coast so it's from montague on the west coast to bay city on the east coast and took us 13 hours <laughs> to do that we were the last ones to arrive in bay city but we made it that was a lot of pain. Oh my goodness. It's, it was the longest day of my life. But you know, now I'm proud that I did it. Okay, my friends, I think this is all I can tell you about Soviet era bikes. Uh, once again, they were really popular and out in the country, in the villages. That was the main mean of transportation for people who lived out of the country. Meanwhile, in the cities, because we had decent public transportation, uh, bikes were used only for pleasure or leisure or by kids. And since we lived in the tall apartment buildings, it was paying the butt uh, to store them. So there was not many bikes out in the cities. Okay, so I think it's time to say the svidaniya, goodbye. And thank you for watching Ushanka show. Please support my work with your likes, with your comments. And we'll talk to you soon. The svidaniya, goodbye.